thank you, Chris, and good morning and happy new year to all of you. We were talking before the service and uh, how these new years seem to come more quickly every year the older you get. And um, that's what David discovered. And so I'm going to look this morning, we're going to look this morning at Psalm 39, where he makes many of those kind of observations and then observes some of the things that we just sang about. Psalm 39, I said, I will guard my ways that I may not sin with my tongue. I will guard my mouth as with a muzzle while the wicked are in my presence. I was mute and silent. I refrained even from good. And my sorrow grew worse. My heart was hot within me. While I was musing, the fire burned. Then I spoke with my tongue. Lord, make me to know my end. And what is the extent of my days? Let me know how transient I am. Behold, you have made my days as hand breaths. And my lifetime has nothing in your sight. Surely every man at his best is a mere breath. Surely every man walks about as a phantom. Surely they make an uproar for nothing. He amasses riches and does not know who will gather them. And now, Lord, for what do I wait? My hope is in you. We sang about that in our hymn. O oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. That's what David discovered. Isaac Watts discovered it, obviously. Deliver me from all my transgressions. Make me not the reproach of the foolish. I have become mute. I do not open my mouth because it is you who have done it. Remove your plague from me. Because of the opposition of your hand, I am perishing. With reproofs you chasten a man for iniquity. You consume as a moth what is precious to him. Surely every man is a mere breath. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear to my cry. Do not be silent at my tears, for I am a stranger with you, a sojourner like all my fathers. Turn your gaze away from me, that I may smile again, before I depart and am no more. May the Lord bless this reading of His Word and, and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow together in a word of prayer. There is an old Anglo-Saxon poem that claims a man cannot grow wise until he has had his share of winters in the world. Winter was hard in olden times. People had to be tough to survive. We wouldn't appreciate that today, but a week ago we certainly were. It's a nice thing about Texas. The weather changes so quickly and we're able to enjoy the warm sunshine today. But winter became a metaphor for hard times, for the trials and the challenges of life. They are a means of producing wisdom, not the only means of producing wisdom. Wisdom greatly comes from the Word of God, but God uses trials and difficulties to produce wisdom. And so sometimes a person must go through some winters to learn it. David did. He wrote of it in Psalm 39. He was king. He had battles to fight and a nation to govern and became preoccupied with all of that. He neglected the eternal for the temporal. That happens to all of us. Then he became sick. He indicated that in verse 10. He was near death. That gave him perspective. And he prayed in verse 4, Lord, make me to know my end. 
And the Lord did. That's the purpose of the psalm, that we might know our end, that we might realize the brevity of life and live wisely with the time that we have. It's a good subject for us to consider on this first day of a new year. To give us that perspective, David takes us through his struggle, his winter, so to speak, beginning with his discouragement over the shortness and the apparent vanity of life. He wanted to speak about the things that were were troubling him, but he didn't dare do that because he was afraid he might say something that would be misunderstood and misinterpreted. So the psalm begins with David resolved to keep silent. He says in verse 1, I said, I will guard my ways that I may not sin with my tongue. I will guard my mouth as with a muzzle. Well, there's great wisdom in that, in learning to guard our mouth as with a muzzle, to learn not to speak, to learn how to hold our peace. There were people who would interpret David's worry as unbelief, so he kept silent. He did that, but it was hard to do that. It's hard to remain quiet when you're going through difficulties, when you're suffering. You need to speak about it. And and he was having difficulty with not speaking about it. He said, my heart was hot within me. He needed to talk about it. But David was a man of great faith, not unbelief. And and finally he did speak in verse 4, not to men, but to God. He expressed his concerns to the Lord and he asked for wisdom. And that, again, is an act of great wisdom. We tend to want to turn to others around us, and that's not always the wrong thing to do, but the best thing to do is always look to the Lord. He's personal. He cares for us. He has all the wisdom. James tells us to do that. If any, man, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all generously and without reproach. He loves to dispense the good things of life to us and to dispense wisdom to us. Well, that's what David did. Unable to resolve the problem himself, he turned to the Lord for instruction. He prayed, Lord, make me to know my end. That's a wise prayer. Life is short, and we need to know that. David prayed, make me to know that. Make me to know how short it is. He said, let me know how transient I am. Ephemeral, just here for the moment. Then in verse 5, he described the brevity of life. He, He compared his life to hand breadths, one of the smallest units of measure in ancient Israel. A hand breadth was... Uh, the width of four fingers, and of course that depends upon the hand, but it's about three inches. So he was saying, Lord, you have made my life three inches long, short, brief, as nothing in your sight. Now we're impressed with people who live to be in their 90s, or some live to be 100. A few of us Listen to a man speak a few a week or so ago who was a pilot in the Second World War. He's 101, and his mind is clearer and sharper than mine is, which isn't saying a lot, I'm discovering, but uh, very impressed that he could live that, that he's lived that long and has such knowledge of things. That's very old to us. But it's all relative, as David points out, because in terms of God, in terms of eternity, it's as nothing. Surely, he says, every man at his best is a mere breath, a a vapor, a puff of smoke. We make our appearance in this world, and then we're gone. And that is man at his best. Literally, a man standing firm, a man in all his strength, a man in all his confidence, a man with full physical strength and mental power, the the smart, the strong, a man at his best, even he is just a, a breath, just a vapor. 
That's what James says. Where he counsels wisdom along the same lines as these that David is giving us. In, in James 4, verses 13 and 14, he warns businessmen against presumption and making overconfident plans about tomorrow. He tells them, you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Make plans. We need to make plans. But be cautious. You and I don't know what's coming tomorrow. And if we're wise, we will live with the knowledge of that reality. You are just a vapor. So where are we headed? If I'm just a vapor, where am I going? Surely every man at his best is a mere breath. Young men, strong men, Athletes gone in a moment. But that's the way it is with life. It is at best short. But it wasn't only the shortness of life that troubled David. It, it was also the, the futility of it. Because, a life, uh, life's, because of life's brevity, our achievements are often brief. Come to nothing. He says that in verse 6. Surely every man walks about as a phantom. Surely every man makes an uproar for nothing. He amasses riches and does not know who will gather them. Now the word nothing in the second line is the same Hebrew word as breath or vapor in verse 5. And it's the word that is found early in the book of Ecclesiastes in chapter 1, verse 2. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher, all is vanity. That's the meaning here. Vanity. In fact, verse 6 is the message of Ecclesiastes. In chapter 2 of that book, Solomon wonders about the outcome of all of his labors. For he says, I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And he doesn't know what kind of man that will be. Maybe he'll be a wise man and, and, and build upon all that Solomon had done and, and produce much more. But he might be a fool. It turned out that he had a fool that did follow him and his son Rehoboam. And that fool might squander everything as he in fact did. Everything that Solomon amassed, everything that he built, was going to go into the hands of someone he had no assurance of being wise or foolish. Well, he recognized that when all is said and done, <clears throat> he has no control over that. No control over the fruit of his labors. And so he concludes, this too is vanity. Now, is it vanity or nothing to work hard? No. No. We're commanded to do that. We're commanded to work, and we're to, we're to work as unto the Lord. Is it, is it vanity to save for retirement? No, that is wise. Is it wrong to enjoy the fruit of our labor? No, it's not. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 4, Paul wrote, Everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with gratitude. God gives us an abundance. And it's to be enjoyed. It's not to be lived for, though. It's not what we're invested in. It, it is not what we are to hope in, the things of this world. That's the problem. Diligence in building a personal kingdom or making a name for ourselves, that is vanity because it ultimately comes to nothing. We are phantoms, he said. We live in a world of shadows where nothing is substantial and nothing we build lasts. The men of this world walk in a mirage, as it were. It seems so real, but it all comes to nothing and it all comes to disappointment. They work hard to make a fortune and make a name for themselves and before long their wealth is gone and others have it and their names are forgotten. Spurgeon wrote about how 
People work hard to make a, a fortune and try to preserve it for their children. But then he wrote, our children die and strangers fill the old ancient halls. Men rise up early and sit up late to build a house. And then a stranger tramps along its passages, laughs in its chambers, and forgetful of its first builder, calls it all his own. David writes, he amasses riches and does not know who will gather them. It's that way in every generation. It's not at all uncommon to pick up a Forbes magazine or the Wall Street Journal and find an article about the heirs of a fortune being in court against each other, brother against brother. Charles Dickens wrote a, a thick novel about that, Bleak House, a story that takes place around a, a long court case contesting a will or several wills over a generation or two that were drawn up to protect a fortune. Jarndyce and Jarndyce drones on, he wrote, on and on until it finally ended the court costs had devoured the whole inheritance. Now, if I ruin the end for you, I'm sorry, but if you start reading it, by the time you're halfway through, you'll have forgotten, because it is probably one of the longest books I've ever read. But uh, Men labor hard to make money, then fret about keeping it, scheme to control it, and in the end, they can't. Surely, David writes, they make an uproar for nothing. So, what do we learn from all of this? Life is brief and vain. That's the reality. What's the lesson? Well, that's what David was asking God to teach him in verse 4. Lord, make me to know my end and what is the extent of my days. Let me know how transient I am. In other words, give me a true picture of life, of its brevity, of its uncertainty, of its meaning, so that I may live wisely. It's what Moses was praying for in Psalm 90. That hymn we sang by Isaac Watts is, a, is all about Psalm 90. And that very sim it's very similar to this this psalm, in Psalm 90, he, he too considered the, the brevity of life. He, he, he writes that, uh, that, that we may live 70 years. Well, I'm, I'm past that now. And, or due to strength 80, I'm not quite there yet. But if I am, or if I ever do reach that age, he says, soon it is gone and we fly away. So he prays, teach us to number our days that we may present to you a heart of wisdom. That's what David wants. A heart of wisdom. He wants to learn the right lesson from, from what he sees of life's brevity and vanity, and he does. His struggle with the brevity of life and, and its ultimate futility, and I might put it this way, as Solomon did, life under the sun, life, everyday life for the the vast majority of this world is vanity, it's futility. That, that all of that, as he understood, gave him insight that led him to the answer as it did Moses before him. The only thing worth desiring is that which lasts, that which is eternal, and that is the Lord God Himself. That's the conclusion David came to in verse 7. My hope is in thee. That's where David finds his joy and meaning in life. It is in the, the Lord and in his relationship with Him. It is in knowing God. It's that simple. Walking with Him daily, that is how to find fulfillment in life. Meaning in life. And that which really lasts. Well, this is the turning point in the psalm, verse 7. And, and with that, David then confesses his sin. Deliver me from all my transgressions, he says. The transgression that he's speaking of here, I think specifically would be putting the things of the world ahead of the Lord, of, of forgetting what, what really matters 
And that is our relationship with Him. David had drifted off. He'd become consumed with the details of life and he'd forgotten the Lord. Well, David saw that now. He said in verse 12 that he's just a sojourner in the world, just, just passing through, meaning uh, and purpose are not found in the things of this life, but in the Lord and 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 who is the one who gives life and who is the one, the one who is eternal. He has ordained life to be short and vain, and He's done that for a purpose. As you notice as you go through the psalm, it's all the Lord who does this. And it's, it's to show man, to show people, men and women, that life ends. We tend to think it's going to go on forever. It ends and man's achievements come to nothing. The Lord's ordained that, that life ends so that we would know that and that our hope is not in this world. David writes in verse 11, with reproofs you chasten a man for iniquity. You consume as a moth what is precious to him. Surely every man is a mere breath. How does a moth consume? It does it silently, it does it secretly. We, we don't watch the moth eat holes in our wool suits. We discover one one day, we discover our suit that it's been the uh, lunch of a moth and before you know it, we, the, a, a nice suit's ruined. And so it is with the human condition. It, it, it appears young and, and strong and alert but over time, without noticing it, we age. There's a great line in Hosea chapter 7, verse 9 about Ephraim. He's talking about the northern kingdom, but that main tribe was Ephraim, the great tribe. And he speaks of Ephraim as a man, and he says um, something like, gray hairs are on him, or gray hairs are sprinkled on him, and he does not know it. That's the way it is. That's life, isn't it? You got a gray hair, really? You think you think you're 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 21 and you're now you're 41, just like that. And a you age and you don't you don't notice it, but that's what happens. And soon it's over. We pass away. And it it, it is all the Lord's doing. It was God's will because of sin, because of iniquity. Paul would later write, the wages of sin is death. In a fallen world, all things die. And David recognized that was according to God's will. You chasten, you consume, he says. Back in verse 5, he said, you have made my hands, my days as handbreadths. The, the Lord determines the number of our days. It's not by chance. Nothing is. And wisdom is realizing that, realizing that He has measured out our days as hand breaths, in inches, it, that life is short. Men try to put that out of their minds and put that out of their thoughts and think that their, tomorrow will never come, but tomorrow always comes, and the end always comes. I hope this doesn't depress. It's not my purpose. It shouldn't depress. It, it's reality. So our prayer should be, because this is reality, our prayer should be, Lord, make me to know my end. Make me to know that life is short. We're just a vapor. And that security and joy are ultimately found only in you. That should be our prayer. That's what David learned. And so, seeking his joy and fulfillment in him, David concludes his prayer in verses 12 and 13 by asking the Lord to hear his prayer and restore him to strength and joy and fellowship with him. That's what's really important. Not the vanities of life, which are fleeting. David had come to realize, or, or I think better to remember, that he was an alien in this world. 
That's how he describes himself in verse 12, as a stranger and a sojourner, a pilgrim in this world. He says that's how his fathers considered themselves and what they were, and that's how Abraham described himself. After Sarah had died, he purchased a cave from the sons of Heth in which to bury her. And in speaking to them, he said, I am a stranger and a sojourner among you. You're the people of the land. I'm a stranger here. All the land of Canaan had been promised to Abraham back in chapter Genesis 13, verse 15. It was all his, but he didn't receive any of it in this lifetime. He will receive it in the future, but during this life, Abraham was a stranger in the land. He lived that way. He lived in tents. He never had a permanent home. He never built a house or a city. The only things Abraham built were altars. The only land he possessed was a grave. He lived in this world as a stranger and sojourner, as a man who knew this world was a world of shadows, phantoms, not a permanent home. He looked for the world to come. That's what Peter encourages us to do. In 1 Peter 2, verse 11, he wrote, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. That's how we are to live. We're to live as strangers in a world that is passing away. John tells us that in 1 John 2, 17. The world is passing away. At this very moment, it's passing away. That's how transient everything is. Our security and meaning are not found in this world, but in our relationship with the Lord and the world to and, and in the hope that we have in Him of the world to come. Now, that's how the Lord tells us to live in Matthew chapter 6, where He says that we are to lay up treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys. That's real wisdom. Our days may be as hand breaths, as nothing in God's sight. Everything that is precious to people in this world, health and wealth, may be eaten up as by a moth. But what we do for the Lord and for His people in the time that we have is forever. It lasts. It cannot be diminished. That's what is really important. Knowing Him and serving Him. And that's for the present as well. That is, the blessing of that is for the present time as well. The blessings aren't only in the future, the greatest are beyond our comprehension, but there's blessing now in the present as we live in fellowship with Him. We were created for that. We were created for fellowship with the triune God. And I think the more we know Him, the clearer reality will be to us, the clearer we will understand things and we will want to please Him as we know Him and then we will be obedient out of the love we have for Him and the joy we have in knowing Him. That's when life is truly fulfilling. And so we are to redeem the time that we have, as Paul says. Use the days that God has given us in His service, few though they may be. Few though they may be, but they are given to us by God. Time is not our enemy. Time is a gift of God. And with it, and He's given us enough time to do this, we learn about Him. We learn more and more about Him. We get to know Him more and more. And the more we do, the more we will want to serve Him and serve Him faithfully and not only serve Him, but do good for others. That's how we serve Him in large part. It's easy to lose sight of, of that. It's easy to allow the, the routines of life, the pursuits that we have in life, and I'm talking about the good pursuits, the things that are, are valuable, even those. They can cloud our vision so that we lose perspective and we begin to live for the present, for now, and for things 
and we become time servers. David did, but he learned the lesson, but he learned it only through a, a great struggle that he had, and through that struggle he regained the, the right perspective. He spent time in sickness, but it opened his eyes to what he was doing and what he needed to do. So let's hope that we don't have to share, have our share of winters to learn that, that we are a mere breath. Even Shakespeare understood that that is what we are. In the Tempest, the magician Prospero makes some spirits, some phantoms vanish. And he says to his daughter, we are such stuff as dreams are made on. And our little life is rounded with a sleep. We're like those spirits, he was saying. Human life vanishes from this world quickly without leaving a mark or memory. Our lives are, are little, that is, they're short, and they're rounded with sleep, that's death. And every goal and plan we have that's built on this life is like a dream that, that disappears. Well, is that your life? Are you pursuing things that don't last, that cannot last? Are you living like a phantom passing through this world? about to vanish and leave nothing permanent behind? Well, that's the world. It's passing away. You can be more than that. You can have eternal life. And, and, in, and in having that eternal life, live a purposeful, meaningful life now, and in doing so, lay up treasures forever. You can be a son or daughter of God, a member of His family, and in His kingdom. We have all of that through faith in Christ. He is God's Son who became a man and died for sinners so that all who believe in Him have forgiveness and life forever. If you've not done that, we encourage you, look to Christ, trust in Him. And may the Lord help all of us to know our end. Remember that we're just transient. We're passing through. We're pilgrims in this world. This is not our permanent home. And with the time that we have, live for eternity. Live for what lasts. Well, I'm going to conclude this service with prayer. Then we'll sing our hymn, and that will be our transition into the Lord's Supper. So... Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your goodness to us, and we thank You for this great psalm and this truth that we need to remember. And we thank You that David, who became distracted by the things of this world, learned his lesson through the sickness that You put him through, the winter that he went through. I pray we'll learn those lessons, Lord, without the difficulties that it sometimes takes to teach them to us, but we might have the right perspective on life. We're beginning a new year. It's so easy to make resolutions that we don't keep, but may it be our resolve to know you better, to deepen our relationship with you. Help us to do that. Enable us to do that that we might live a life that is pleasing to you and of eternal worth. So we ask you to bless us, Lord. Bless us now as we sing our hymn. Bless us now as we take the Lord's Supper in remembrance of you. Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. In Christ's name. Well, let's stand and sing number 41 in the Songs of Praise book, a praise book, Behold the Lamb, number 41.